thank you very much for, for joining us Sorry? today. You speak English, Mandarin, and a Chinese dialect called Diuchu. Diuchu. Yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Now, can I just clarify something Please very do. quickly? When you mean speak, you know, speak is a very loosely used term. There's a broad church. I speak. I do speak Mandarin as a second language. And I think my, my dialect is something more I understand, definitely, particularly okay. when my grandparents used to speak to me. But me speaking it, I don't know. Maybe I'd sound like a five-year-old, but but that's but I do understand. You give it a good go. Yeah, yeah, I give it a good go. I give it a good go. If you drop me in the middle, you know, with a helicopter into the middle of, of, of the, the I, I would be able to survive. So um, growing up, how important was it for you to to speak or understand more than more than more than one language? I was born in I was born in the UK. Okay, so I learned English as a first language, and actually, it's the language I spent most. I only speak to my parents still in English. My first experience of another language came when my grandparents, who are from Singapore, visited my folks in the UK. Now they don't speak English. And so they only spoke to me in the dialect. So actually my second language that I actually learned, technically speaking, um, by osmosis rather than by actual official learning, was Teochew. So that became very important. And actually it wasn't learning because, you know, you're one, two, three, suddenly you're a toddler, you go, ah, oh, you, you know, and then these strange people come along and speak to you in, an, in another language. And if you, very quickly, you begin to understand what they meant, whatever they were saying is lunchtime, is dinner time, go have a bath, what, what, whatever, whatever it was. So it was definitely critical in me being able to even communicate and answer and, and understand my grandparents, but I didn't learn it. It just came because they were speaking to me all the time only in that one language. So that's what you mean by you can you can understand it rather than rather than that's necessarily right. speaking. That's, that's correct. That's right. So I couldn't sit here and give you any give you any grammar and anything because I never learned it. It was all spoken to me. We won't ask you to do the rest of the interview in in Dutch. Either. Thank you. We'll, Thank we'll, you. We'll stick with English for that. Thank you. But the first official learning of another language came and then when I moved back to Singapore and I must have been. Um, yeah, I was five years old at the time. So it would have been then entering kindergarten, okay, in, in, in Singapore. And Singapore is, a, is an ex-British British colony. And so people actually learned English because of colonialism as a first language. And then whatever, 75% Chinese, Singapore, 20% Malaysian, uh, uh, and 5%, 4% probably Indian, so South Asian Indians, 1% of everything else, okay? And so when, when we were there, you learned English, Whatever, whatever it is, because you took GCSEs, you did A-levels, all of the things that you, that you do here in the UK. Um, but then you had mandated, you had to learn a second language. I was in Newcastle for four years. So a five-year-old coming back to Singapore, I had a Geordie accent because I learned English to speak. Okay, so yeah, exactly. Just let's throw that into the mix. Okay, so, so I understood Teochew. I had a Geordie accent, a Geordie accent. and I was... I was Chinooked, parachuted back into Singapore, now having to learn Chinese as a second language. And so it was a very weird mixture. I, I, well, I don't know how weird it was for a five-year-old, but then I began learning a Mandarin officially. And I hated it with the passion of a thousand sons. Why? Because suddenly I was made to learn it. So um, can you explain to us uh, nowadays the different situations in which, in which you would use each of the languages that you speak or understand? Is there for example, is the one that you don't use at all anymore? Do you do you flip between them? Ah, uh, so Teochew, uh, given that my I mean, my grandparents have have all passed on a long time ago, and so that undoubtedly is the one I use the least, if not at all. When I use Teochew, would be if I was suddenly in a situation um, where you spotted another Teochew person. I use it to try and form a connection, which is primarily, I guess, what we use languages for. But what do I use Mandarin for? I work here at the University of Cambridge, okay, and there are a lot of Chinese, mainland Chinese, Mandarin speakers, either from Taiwan or from China or from any other Mandarin-speaking uh, part of the world, come here, either as students, as postdocs. And for connection purposes, even though my, my lingua franca, my, my communication is always in English, once again, the opportunity to form a connection with the student at first, um, I take the advantage and I take the opportunity when, when given it. And so when I know that they speak Mandarin, I will always, um, after ha having a few words in English, hi, 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 my name is who, what, what, what have you, I'll, I will always get them to say their actual name in Mandarin. I'll say it back to them. I'll tell them my Mandarin name, um, you know, 
and it forms a connection which to me is very uh, uh, valuable. So I do use it now and I tend to use it as a tool to, to break barriers down and to, and to begin forming a relationship. It probably creates quite an inclusive environment for your students as well to sort of feel like they're, if they've come maybe English isn't their first language, they've come to study from another place, it probably makes them feel quite comfortable I, I to hope. be able to communicate in that way. It's true, I hope it makes place. them feel comfortable. Sometimes they laugh at me because of my funny <laughs> accent. I don't think I have the, an the accent. Geordie coming yeah, out. That, that's right, that's right. Chinese Geordie. I don't know what that is, Chinese Geordie accent. But um but but so I do think it makes them feel comfortable, more comfortable, and that's why that's why I do it. Isn't that our whole purpose? You know, if I'm here and trying to be a mentor or an empl or an employer um, or a supervisor, that you want to have that relationship and that comfort. And once the comfort is established, I find that it's difficult to take away. How does speaking the variety of language that you speak or understand contribute to your to your sense of identity? Greatly, I think greatly. So, so the other place which I use my Mandarin probably the most, aside from speaking to my my stepmom, is in in restaurants. And look, I am a I well I study food intake. That's that's actually my day job. Okay, I study how our brain controls food intake, but I also happen I'm also a big foodie huge foodie, I love food. And so it forms a part of my identity, not only from professionally, but also culturally, because you know I enjoy, I enjoy all foods, but I particularly enjoy Chinese food. I don't want to back myself into a stereotype, but I do. And so having, being able to pronounce and actually call the various dishes in the language it was meant to be uh, called, I do think adds uh, uh, to, to the identity. And I like to think enhances the, the, the experience within, within a restaurant, either here in the UK, back in the States, in Hong Kong, where, 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 wherever I end up being and be eating Chinese food. Brilliant. I like Chinese food too. It's fantastic, but I cannot pronounce anything. So that would be really great. <laughs> exactly. See, I, if you had dinner with me, uh, uh, I would enhance the experience. Exactly, exactly. So it's very lucky. You've lived in several very multicultural cities. We've got Boston, we've got Singapore, and obviously Cambridge. Um, do you experience a big culture shock when you move to a, to a completely new place? The biggest culture shock that I had was when I emigrated from Singapore eventually to San Francisco. Okay. And at that time, I was 15 years old. Okay. Now, 58 with teenagers. Okay. We're monosyllabic. I have a Y chromosome, that's even worse. We're half syllabic, right? And then, and then there was a huge culture shock for me, even though I spoke English, okay? Let's just keep it fair here, right? Where, you know, I did speak the language, but then I went from learning British English, which it is, that's what Singaporeans speak, because of, uh, 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 to going into an Amer American English place. That's the first thing. Americans, Californians in particular, tend to be more tactile and huggy than, than, than Chinese people who are just not at all. Um, and also there was the, the, there was the food element. And so I think um, the culture shock was huge, but interestingly, not because of Mandarin, but because of the different types of English that I was speaking. And it took me a while. I mean, now I can do it. I've got two halves of my brain. I've got an American half. I've got a, I've got a British half. And the moment I land in California, everything, the, 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 everything just shifts. Um, whereas within that time, it was difficult. People kept saying, what's up? What's up? I'm going, nothing's up. Nothing's up. Wrong? I'm fine. What's up just as hello. But surprising to me how big that culture shock was. And then in reverse, okay, then I did high school um, and university and undergrad in San, San Francisco in California. And, and I'd like to argue that from a learning perspective and a cultural perspective, very, very formative, okay, particularly the last two years of high school and all of all of my undergrad. Okay? And I became Californian. I sounded Californian, you know. I, look, I'm only wearing long trousers because I'm speaking to you guys today. Otherwise, I'd be in shorts, board you know, shorts. board shorts yeah. and, and, and sandals. I don't even wear shoes. I'm not joking. I don't even wear shoes in my office, okay? It's just it's like a very zen type of, type, type of scenario. Um, but when I then moved here from California, and once again, you say, but you learned English in... That was another culture shock, huge culture shock, the reverse move from California back to Cambridge. It took me a good six months to settle in comfortably. Now I'm like a chameleon. I will change my accent to match you. <laughs> it's an excellent skill. Um, so what role would you say that language plays in helping people integrate into a new society? I think it will play a huge role, okay? And I think it plays it, in particular in today's, in today's society that we actually live in, okay? where, where I think 
integration is a strong word because I think you, you, you think then of people coming in assimilating, like the Borg, you know, assimilating people. But I do think that understanding the language of the area you're moving into has to be helpful. Um, in fact, I don't understand it. There are places in San Francisco, Chinatown, which is a very big Chinatown, in which there are people who have been there almost an entire generation and a second generation who A, have never left Chinatown and B, still speak only in Cantonese, just for example. I do think that if you don't speak the language, you have a tendency to, to, to ghettoize, to form ghettos, not in a ghetto type of scenario, but in terms of a, in, in a immigrant ghetto scenario. And that's fine to some degree, but I don't know how that helps um, in terms of improved relationships, particularly in a situation today where we have large movements of people. You studied in Cambridge mm -hmm. and you now work here. Can only assume you quite like, quite like the city. Um, what made you want to ultimately make, make Cambridge your home? First, I married an English woman. <laughs> That's the primary reason I would have thought. And actually, uh, 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 it, is a, it, is a, it is a key reason. The second reason is I'm hardly slumming it in Cambridge when it comes to science. And I think that, that, being, that being the point. So I think it was a place for work that, that actually worked. But from a personal domestic scenario, okay, I mean, she was my wife later, but it, my girlfriend at the time, you know, and we made the decision to stay in Cambridge after I finished my, after I finished my, my PhD. How many times have you been punting? Too many times. I'm, I'm, many? I'm okay. Can I'm you, not particularly too quick. Many times? No, I don't. Well, you can. I'm not going to go today. By the way, for those of you who don't know, it's February. So, so. <laughs> it is cold it and is it's cold. windy. But I do like punting. Yes. And so you've spent many years working on some very high-profile scientific projects mm -hmm. throughout throughout your career. Yeah. Science is a field that brings together people from all over the world who speak a multitude of languages. Yeah. How important is global communication do you think now global communication in science is critical that being said english speakers are spoilt and english speakers are spoilt because the lingua franca of certainly biological science and i can only speak for biological science um, because i'm a biologist is english okay you could be in the lab they could be two chinese postdocs they could be two italian postdocs they could be two spanish postdocs whatever and what you hear is blah 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 dna blah 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 western blood blah 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 pcr so you could sit there as an english speaker because we're spoiled okay and 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 just listen to your uh, to, to the conversation not have any idea all of the linking words but understand they have a problem with their dna in their pcr you know today because of a contamination because of a contamination do you feel your own language skills have helped you throughout your career my career wise probably no okay because as i said because i spoke um english specifically for my career because i spoke english i don't think knowing how to speak another language necessarily helped my career progression but once i got to the position where i was having to interact and supervise and and and, and mentor other people um I'm a tutor, for example, at, at Wolfson College here, and I then have to sort out problems, smooth over issues. That is when my other languages then came into play. Your work in science has turned you into somewhat of a TV personality, we might say. <laughs> um, how, if at all, would you say confidence in communication translates to confidence on camera? I think, it, I think it translates directly. I think the ability then to communicate um, and the ability to communicate under difficult circumstances and under pressure, that is what uh, um, um, translates to the camera. So I do think that it has actually, um, I think it actually has been an advantage uh, uh, for me, being able, being able to communicate. I, actually, it probably, you asked me if my language skills have been an advantage. I have utilized very rarely the Mandarin speaking elements of it um, and on, on occasion. Oh, you have? What, what, what occasions have you, have you utilized that? So two times, both in, once in a Chinatown in Nottingham mm -hmm. and once in, a China, uh, once in London Chinatown, where um, we definitely filmed elements of me speaking to either the proprietor of, of mm -hmm. a specific restaurant, we were filming something there, um, and a, both proprietors of restaurants, okay, and the proprietor of another restaurant, both in Mandarin, just, just, and they caught just some inter in, in interaction, interaction there. But, but interestingly, once again, as a diplomatic tool to soothe scenarios, because camera people take a lot of space and take a lot of time and annoy other customers, the ability then to speak, because um, I would be the only Chinese speaker on set. If there were problems to be solved, and soothed over, I could do it with Chinese. You mentioned that alongside 
your own research and your television work, you also tutor students. Mm -hmm. Do many of them have first languages other, other than English? Actually, the vast majority of people at Wilson, a significant majority of the people at Wilson do not speak English as a first language. And so, interestingly, having another language in your boat, even if it's not the same language as the person opposite you, can also be used as a tool at times to, 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 to calm things down. To, to actually form some kind of camaraderie, for example, like that, when they're having some cultural difficulty, when they may be having an issue with their uh, supervisor entirely based on a cultural clash, okay? Where if you can uh, uh, um, draw from some experience, and I have drawn from experience, you're then able to put the person across you in comfort and it increases your chances of solving the problem. I have to say, because I'm not typically interviewed about this, I have to say that enunci I've never actually enunciated it out loud before until you've asked me, and I think you're probably right, actually. Once, once, I've, once I've thought about it, yeah, I have, I have actually, and enunciated it, you're right. It has been a very, even known to me, it's one of these things, it's something in, my, in my, the back of my head, I don't actually study it anymore. You're right, it has been actually very useful to my career. After having said it wasn't, yeah. <laughs> I think you, it, it might very well have been useful in my career, but just in, not in a direct fashion. Yeah, your career in terms of the other people. Yeah, 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 career. yeah. Which, which is important to my career. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a re re really interesting take on it. Um, going back to your students again, mm. um, do you think having learnt or learning English as a second or third language opens up study opportunities for them and future career opportunities for them? Everyone that we that gets accepted by Cambridge, by its definition, has English certainly as a second language, sometimes third, sometimes even fourth. The, the people you meet and their linguistic skills puts all of us first language English speakers to shame. I'm sure you have plenty of advice for your budding scientist students. Yes. However, what, what would a word of advice for, for language learners of, of today be? I think there's two different reasons to learn a language. Okay, and I think, um, and it's, it, to, to, to me, it's, it's a mindset. I just draw the examples in which I learned a language because someone was speaking to me and so I understood the language, but I wasn't felt, teochu, but I wasn't felt that I had to sit there and memorize the vocab and, and, and practice the strokes, because in Chinese you have to do the calligraphy as well, not, not, just, not just pronunciation. Um, whereas then was, when I was made to do something I didn't want to do, and I didn't see the value in it, Okay, it made it very, very difficult. So I think if you're gonna learn a language, it's fine, sometimes you have to learn a language and, and I, we can't do anything about that. But if you're actually making, you're learning a language out of choice, out of choice, then I think that distinction between understanding the language and simply learning it, okay, I think is critical in your ability to embrace and actually become good better at, at, at the language when, when you speak. So I think understanding rather than just learning something, because I think you can learn something by rote and not actually understand it at all. And that's what I probably did for the first decade of my life studying Mandarin, if, you want to, if I want to be uh, uh, fair. Um, I'd love to go back and learn, if I had the time to learn Mandarin now, I'd take a completely different view. That You might say that's because I'm an adult now, but I would take a different view because I value it so much more believe me, than when someone was taunting me over the head when I was 10 years old and I was trying to do the calligraphy of some, of some random word. Yeah, so would you think it would be a correct statement to say that learning, it, it doesn't just take place in a classroom. Learning is an immersive experience. No, not, not just something that you go to school and you learn and then you, and then you, you stop when you when you're out of the classroom. I think so. I don't want to sound like a fortune cookie. You sound like a fortune cookie. <laughs> Just to keep it the theme. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think you do have to immerse yourself within, within something in order to end up understanding um, the language. And I think actually understanding the language very often means in some small way understanding elements of the culture as well. You may have a weird accent, but if you use the language at the right tone, in the right occasion, because of your understanding of the culture, that will always trump having a crisp, accentless uh, 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 language, but using it like a bull in a china shop. If we can use another language, even in broken style, but culturally appropriately, 
to, 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 to actually smooth over problems. And I think that is far more valuable than necessarily being grammatically correct, um, accentless in everything that you speak. Being grammatically correct but saying nothing of value. <laughs> That's right. Maya D'Angelo uh, uh, said, the, the American author, said this famous thing. In the future, people do not remember what you say. People remember how you make them feel. And I think if you think about language like that, where you want to learn enough of the language, as much of it as, as, as you can, but make them feel good, that's what they'll remember about you. And they say, Giles, yeah, he spoke Chinese. I don't, right? But, but, because, but because I made them feel better, they think I spoke Chinese. Yeah, so yeah, they remember, they remember you as someone who made them feel good and included, Correct. and they won't really remember how you actually said it, just that they understood. Correct. Ah, oh, it's a lovely sentiment. So finally, just to finish, won't make you say a line in your dialect, but could you say one line of advice or just something that resonates with you in Mandarin for us? Oh my God, you didn't tell me you were going to do this. Um... <laughs> you can say- Ah, you can okay, say okay, 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 okay. Keeping, 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 keeping with my food hat on. Yes. Okay, so this is, this is not too deep, okay? But keeping with my, with my food hat on, this is a phrase which I think resonates throughout all cultures, okay? Yeah, excellent. Okay, now what that means, actually I'll, I'll convert it into the English, into the English saying, mm -hmm. eat like a king at breakfast, okay? Eat like a prince at lunch and eat like a pauper at dinner. Or in Chinese, it is eat well at breakfast, eat eat till you're full at breakfast, eat well at lunch, eat very little at dinner. And this is the whole concept of when you eat being being important. It's something which, uh, because when you fall asleep, you burn less energy, et cetera, et cetera. That is what I'm going to end with. Oh, so that's kind of related to your to, to your science research exactly. into, in, into food that's right. and diet. Correct. Well, excellent. That's a great way to finish. Um, thank you. That was really interesting. We've learned a lot about your background and too much you, about you, me you've, probably you've learned things about yourself I as have, well and it has helped your career because of all the like people you've met along yeah. the way that you can feel like you've helped as well Absolutely. so, so thank, thank you, you. So thank you very much for joining us thank you <laughs>